on us by the word of the Lord were the heavens made the starry host by the breath of his mouth he gathers up the waters of the sea into jars let all the earth forever fear the Lord. May your unfailing love rest upon us as we put our hope in you. Lover of righteousness and of justice, may your unfailing love Rest on us, the wisdom of the Lord stands forever strong from age to age. He will reveal his heart. We wait upon the Lord, who is our help and shield, and be glad because we trust his holy name. You stand firm forever. You are righteous, and we wait and hope for you. find favor with God. They say Abraham would have done that. And so they try to live like Abraham would have. I sat beside one of them in Sail Barn on, on Tuesday. And he began to tell me what he believed. And then he said, um, Jesus didn't die for my sins. And so I waited until he gave me a chance to talk. Then I said, Jesus died for my sins. And he just smiled. You know, Jesus died for his sins, but it did no good until the day he believes that. Jesus died for all of our sins. The blood was sufficient. It doesn't take the yearly sacrifice. He was the perfect lamb. And as we read our Sunday school lesson this morning, I just see John the Baptist they were looking for the Messiah. They were waiting for him. And he says, there he is. Behold the Lamb of God. The perfect Lamb. We don't need the daily sacrifice anymore. There he is. The Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. You know, many the Muslims, they... they they acknowledge Jesus. In fact, many of them even believe that he is divine. Born of a virgin. Many believe he's divine, but they don't believe that he died for their sins. In fact, this man told me that. He said, he, he didn't die for my sins. That would have to be someone else. Because God can't die. And so even if they believe he was divine, and yet somehow something else, it was another person that died. It looked like Jesus. It wasn't. Because God can't die, they say. The Jews. You know, they longed for the Messiah, but they say he didn't come. And even while he walked their streets, they lamented and they said, the Messiah has not come. You know, the time is here, but he's not come yet. According to Josephus. You know, today, there are many Christians who say that Jesus died for their sins, but they live for the devil. You know, if, if Jesus hasn't touched our lives, if he hasn't taken away our sin, if he hasn't changed our life, he hasn't changed our destiny. Yes, Jesus died for our sins, but until I believe it, until I act on that, it has not changed my destiny. 
And if I this morning claim that he died for my sins, and yet I live for the world, I follow the world, I follow my own fleshly desires, I will spend eternity in the same place that those who say Jesus never died. You know, some grow up with the solid teaching. They know the way. They have heard the way. They know it. They've heard it taught Sunday after Sunday. But they never claim it for their own. Others claim it. But as God looks in their hearts, He sees the secret sins. He sees their love for the world. They have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. It's easy to look out there and say, well, we don't, we're not there. We won't go there. We, don't go, we won't spend eternity with those people. They're going to hell because they don't believe in Jesus. But my friends, unless my life shows that I really believe in Jesus and that he has cleansed my life, my eternity will be with those others, with the adulterers, with the murderers, the unbelievers. But thank God, there are some who know that Jesus died for their sins. There are some who know, and out of a heart of gratitude for what He has done, they surrender their will, their life, their energy to the Master. Surrender everything because Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. And those people experience eternal life. Those people experience the joy of having sins forgiven. And I thank God for that. Jesus is the way to God. He is the truth. And when way plus truth equals life. When we know the way and we live it out, we apply truth to our lives, it equals life, eternal life. And that is what Jesus said. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. I was blessed as I, again, was reminded that Jesus died for my sins. He is the answer. And today as we sit here again and listen to a message by Brother Laverne, it's another opportunity, another chance to hear God's call and to walk in His ways and to have our sins forgiven. May God bless you. Extend Christian greetings to each one that is here. <clears throat> it is a blessing to be gathered together, to be in God's house with God's people. I uh, just happen to, to think about this sitting here. I'm sure, pretty sure, that most of you know that Brother Simon did come home yesterday. I received word of that, and so uh, I'm not sure how all that will go. But uh, let's let's remember to pray for them as they go through the next couple weeks. I've been blessed in being here, sitting in our Sunday school class this morning. There's something about uh, Sunday morning, going to church, and, you know, we get up every morning, and God needs to be part of our life every morning, but there's this set-apart time when we focus on, I, I would say, the essence of life, spiritual life. We're talking about life in a different way than in the physical sense. And this morning, I don't know if, if um, yeah, I, I don't quite understand why God led the way he did because I was studying for another message, and this is kind of the way it turned out, and I'm not complaining. But probably because of, of the circumstances of this week, this past week, and some of the experiences that I had led me to this. And I've titled this message, message, The Surprising Ways of God. And I say that, and even the title, you could say The Amazing Ways of God, but that, that seems kind of lightweight because why are God's people surprised at God's ways? 
if you can say that at least. But uh, uh, I, I was a part of a situation this week that just, it, it just, in some ways, it was so weighty, and I can't go into detail here, but in other ways, I thought, you know, in the worst, most adverse circumstances that you and I can dream up, God has a surprising way to work and to move. Move even people that have don't acknowledge God whatsoever. To move and to order, and, and, and it just kind of uh, made me stop and, and take stock of the fact that my what I think is logically possible and what is possible through Jesus Christ and through God are often two different things. And I would profess to be a Christian. I mean, I hope you believe me when I say that, but uh, I, I am still a human being, and sometimes I just have to stand back and say, that was God. It was beyond what any human being could orchestrate or what could be done, humanly speaking. Oddly enough, persecution brings growth to the church often, and prosperity does the opposite. Why? Does that make sense to you? People are told to stay at home, persecuted for their faith, and the church grows. Does that make sense? Not on a human level. That doesn't make sense. On the other hand, when everyone's able to afford nice, fancy cars and clothes and whatever else they want, why is it? And we know there's a lukewarmness there that, that tends to follow peace and prosperity. It's God's dilemma. The people of God cry out for this peace and prosperity. Please, God, bless us both physically, however, and then we tend to take that to the extremes. I'm uh, At the outset here, I'm just going to look at various scriptures here. There's no way that I can uh, address this subject fully, and you're going to say that's like Swiss cheese. He's left most of it out that he should have said. But uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 127, uh, verse 27 says this, God hath chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. I'm not sure if I would rephrase that, how I would rephrase it, but it seems to me that what I feel is, or what, humanly speaking, we think is foolishness, God can use in his own way to bring about change, and in a surprising way. And I would ask this question, were you this week watching to see what God was going to do in your life? Were you surprised at how God worked? Was there anything that happened in your life that you, you looked at and you said, boy, that really was a God moment. That was a time when, when God was uh, at work. You know, it's so easy to kind of uh, become bitter and, and we pray daily, and seemingly God doesn't answer, and he doesn't probably the way that we, we pray sometimes. And I've been glad at times that he didn't, uh, just because I prayed maybe in a, a selfish way. And many, many people quit trying because it seems like they just, you know, they're, they're, whatever they're praying for, their their situation isn't getting better maybe their marriage is the same as it's been and they're whatever they get bitter and gradually they they um, leave the kingdom walk away don't come to church and and uh, they're no longer engaged and I guess probably what I'm aiming at right here is how is your personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ right now where is there a connection do you feel connected to Jesus to God or ha has life dealt with you in such a way that that you're, well, we pray, but we kind of half-heartedly pray, and we hope that God hears us, but we're no longer with it. Reminds me, and this is maybe off course, but reminds me of a story that Sam Widener Jr. said many years ago, vice president of operations where I work. He, he told the, the story, uh, he said what Zig Ziglar said, many of you know that he was a motivational speaker, and how he trained his flies when he was growing up. He put some flies in a can, and, and this is, I'm saying this because sometimes people come into the kingdom, they're all excited and then things don't turn out and all of a sudden they're bitter, they, they quit trying. Well, these flies in the can 
flew up against that lid on and on and on and on. They flew up against that lid until finally they realized they're not getting out. They're hitting, they're going to hit that lid. And then after they settled down, he took the lid off and the flies stayed in. You know, if we live our Christian life like that, we just kind of give up on God. We just lose that vision for God. I, I thought that was, it spoke to me not because Zig Ziglar is very spiritual, if you will, more motivational than spiritual, but there, there is a tendency that God's people have of getting hard in the pew. Just, we go to church, but there's no connection anymore. We don't, we're not amazed at God anymore. We're not surprised. Additionally, I expect, I'm not alone when I say this, that we expect God to work in a certain way. So if I pray and fast, and if I do what I'm supposed to, great riches should follow. People should love me for it. We have our expectation maybe in the wrong direction. Well, I'm going to begin by reading a few verses in Genesis, and I, I think I'm going to ask you to stand up. I think it's too warm in here. People are getting a little tired, or I'm not speaking loud enough. Uh, but uh, anyway, let's, let's look at the life of Abraham. Start there, Genesis chapter uh, 12, and read verse 1 to, 1 to 4, and, and then think about this a little bit. The surprising ways of God, in, in uh, Genesis chapter 4, you, you read the lineage of Abraham, and then you come to, to chapter 12, uh, what did I say, 4? Chapter 12, verse 1 to 4. Now the Lord had said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, and unto a land that I will show thee. Now that in and of itself, there are people here that have experienced leaving what was normal and coming here. And there are others that have always been here. And there's no change. But that change in and of itself is daunting. Leave what seems normal, your father's house in a new land, a new place. And then, he, then God says this, And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in these shall all families of the earth be blessed. So Abraham departed. He just obeyed. As the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him, and Abraham was 75 years old when he departed out of Haran. Now, just a few pages back, verse or chapter 15, I'm going to read these verses 1 to 6, and then I'll have you sit down as I expound on this a little bit. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abraham in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abraham, I am thy shield, thy exceeding great reward. And Abraham said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. And Abraham said, Behold, to me, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, this shall not be thine heir, but he shall come forth out of thine own bowels, shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven, towards heaven, and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And this is what amazes me. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. So we see there there was a progression here, and then you can, be, you can be seated if you like. First of all, let's go back to uh, chapter 12. Wouldn't it make sense that if God was going to do something, he would pick a young man like Daryl, and he would say, he's a young strapping guy, lots of energy. Let's take him out there and send him over there. He's, he's pretty durable. We, he can get kicked around a little bit. He's young enough to handle it. But he took a 75-year-old man. A 75-year-old man. And this is what I want you to think about this morning. The, the surprising ways that God works. It's not, it doesn't matter how old or how young you are. God can and will use his people to satisfy what needs to be done in his kingdom. I'm far more concerned about stubbornness in those that claim or name 
Jesus as their personal Savior than I am about their age. That, that is a far greater problem than your age is. God can use old and young. I want us to be clear on that. It's surprising. He was 75 years old, and I don't know if Sarah was younger. I didn't do my study on that. But through their obedience, this older couple, and maybe they would say they were middle-aged. I'm, they were beyond middle-aged. They were ready for re- retire. I mean, maybe past retirement age. I don't know. But through their obedience, surprisingly, God told them before they ever got there that he is going to bless all the families of the earth. The surprising ways that God works. Uh, we could spend all morning on Abraham, the life of Abraham. Perhaps he was obedient, and that's why God chose him. Perhaps there was something about, we don't know all these things, we have to kind of guess. Now, I I have to say this. If God has a surprising way to, to, to do things, one thing that he does not do to us, to you, or anyone else is mess with your free will to walk away from what he's asking you to do he doesn't that he doesn't touch and he doesn't use we logically when we think of of setting things in motion there has to be some force somewhere we have to make order you know in the business world or wherever you're at but god he's he asks his people through his spirit to do things and then he depends on those people to do his uh amazing things that happen in the kingdom of God. Now, we read in in chapter 15. Now, how would you feel at 75 years of age, strange land, wherever he went, God said, I'm going to, you're going to multiply, but no children. We know these stories. We we read these stories, but it it occurred to me that, that God does amazing things He did, and he still does. The same God is still working today. And and so the challenge here is that what surprises me is that they had no children, but God was saying, you're going to be a huge uh, nation. Now, Genesis 17, he comes back again, and he he goes at it again. And and, uh, I'm, I'm not going to read all of that, but we could spend a lot of time Uh, Again, he talks about being a great nation, and Abraham did what maybe many of us would have done under pressure from God. They they took things in their own hands, and and her maid had a baby from Abraham, thinking that this is God's way. And I'm sure they, like me, could have explained everything to God and, and felt good about it, but God said no. Genesis 17, uh... He, he came back again, and he said, no, it will be from Sarah. And, and finally, in Genesis 18, Sarah had, she laughed about it. And I don't blame her. I'm, I'm not saying that to be funny. I'm just saying, logically speaking, how was this supposed to happen? And maybe it was different in that day than in our day. But... One thing I want to notice in Genesis 18, verse 14, just this one line, and this is something that that we, we are still, I remind us again, serving the same God, and in your circumstances, wherever you're at, remember this, this question, is anything too hard for the Lord? Is anything? Is there anything that is too hard for God to do in your lives, in in your family, in your, where you're at? Is there anything that is too hard for God? I think many of us would say, no, we we believe that. Do we live it? That's my challenge to myself and us this morning. And then finally, and the last thing I want to note on Abraham is Genesis 22, when God asked him to offer his only son does that make sense but god again in a surprising way took that through his obedience and he he worked things out that amaze amaze me to this day in obedience abraham went 
Next, I'd like to focus a little bit on Joseph. And from here on out, I'm not going to read. I'm just going to have us think things through. You know, the, the surprising thing about Joseph is uh, he, he could have done exactly what I uh, do sometimes. God, what are you doing with me? I'm just a little Amish boy. What, what good can I do in this world? And then I kind of go down the list and make my excuses. And Joseph could have said, God, I'm just a little Hebrew boy. What do you want from me? I was placed on this earth. Now my brothers hate me. Now I'm sold into slavery. Now I'm lost over there in prison because of something I didn't do. And on and on and on. But the surprising thing is that in prison, and we could talk a long time about Joseph's character, but in prison, nonetheless, because he interpreted dreams, God used that to save his people, many people. The surprising ways of God. How would you have gone about fixing that situation? And I'm not, say, I'm not finding fault with how any of you go about fixing any situation because I, come, I bump into it all the time. I think, where did that come from? What are we going to do now? How's that going to work? How will that, that pan out? But the surprising way that, that, that Joseph got into Pharaoh's court, second in charge, left prison, God can do it. If he can do that, he can do whatever he wants with whoever he wants or chooses if they cooperate. We'll talk about that some more. The key verse I like in Joseph's story is found in Genesis 50, uh, verse 20. His brothers were afraid of revenge. And this is maybe the, the key verse for this message. But as for you, and this is what Joseph said, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. You, you are in your situation wherever you're at in life. And you're facing, maybe you're not facing anything. Maybe life is, is cushy for you. Maybe you're, there's uh, nothing, no challenges in your life. But I would guess that all of us that are breathing and, and engaged, we are facing things that look rather impossible, rather daunting. There are questions that go with us, you know, go to bed with us. And, and what people mean for evil sometimes, God can use to bring about change. Leaving Joseph, I thought of Jonah, unwilling servant that he was, he was unwilling until he got into the belly of the whale and all of a sudden it changed his mind. And God said, okay, there you go. You go preach now. And I don't know if Jonah was willing even when he, when he went, but that's beside the point. God, if Jonah can use, if, if God can use Jonah, he can probably use whoever he wants to. And he can orchestrate events that will bring people uh, going his direction. Uh, Paul was, uh, this is one that I thought of. Paul, next to Job, in my mind, suffered greatly for the name and the cause of Christ. Young man killing Christians surprisingly became one of the greatest advocates for the early church. And I wonder, we wonder in amazement, why, why did God choose a man, a young man, full of fire, killing Christians, to not only become a part of the church, but I think he wrote 13 or 14 books that we now hold in our hand as a Bible, if you count Hebrews as his, I don't know if he wrote or not. But Paul, God used him in an amazing way. He wasn't only thrown in prison, but he was often shackled to Roman soldiers. And what to me, now just think about it if that was you, to me, seems like defeat of the worst sort. As a preacher of the gospel, he used in, in an amazing way. God works in surprising ways. Now, we could say that we could talk about character and how they, these men, I, that would be okay to do that. But I think the greatest most one of the most amazing things that happened in human history or maybe the amazing thing the, the most the most surprising thing that I can think of is Jesus birth in Bethlehem in a little
lowly stable to save us. To save us from our sins. To save us. To get us to heaven. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about all of this. I just want us to think about this this morning. What does it take for you and I to be a part of God's amazing plan? Is going to church enough? Is going to Rosewood enough? Is being a Sunday school teacher enough to be used? All that I suggested so far are good and they can be enough if. And I'm going to, to take this a little bit further. I don't know if you were keeping track of this as I was going. And I, there, well, let me just say this. I noticed as I was thinking about the surprising ways that God works and who He used and how He used these people. And I realized that there were two things, at least two things, that all of them carried with them in order for, for God's purpose to be fulfilled. And, and I thought of submission and obedience to God. Ultimately, their focus was on submitting to God's call. You know, I think if Abraham would have waited five years or stalled off, made excuses, said, no, I can't do it, think about all that's over in that land and all the things that are going to happen to me, I don't think God, he may have found someone else. He was obedient. Submission and obedience. As long as we fight against what God has brought to our lives, as ugly as it might be, as long as we're fighting against it, we are shutting the door on God's ability to use us to do His will. Let me say that again. If we are fighting and complaining, I want to put that word in because that's where I find myself so many times. Complaining in my spirit. How did that happen to me? That wasn't supposed to happen. That wasn't in the plan. But as long as we are pushing against God and the circumstances we're in, God cannot use us. Why are we surprised at, at God when He works? I, ask, I just ask this question in general. Why does it surprise me when all of a sudden things happen? I, I wonder if it really doesn't come down to the fact that I haven't focused on Him enough to really realize and notice the little things that He does for me every day. And then the big things kind of slip out of my peripheral vision. What What is it that surprises you? I, I have a pretty close connection with a man from Indianapolis, and, and some of you might relate to this because you face death in your family, and you, you just relate to this maybe a little bit better than I do. This man has stood with me. I've stood with him. We've spent time together. Lost his wife a little over a year ago. And and you can apply this to your situation. You might be low on money this morning. Your family might have cut you off or whatever it is. But he said quietly that when I lost my wife of 60-some years, I don't know how long they were married. They weren't married maybe that long, but they were together for almost that, and he's a Christian, would profess to be a Christian. He said, I, I would just, at the end of the day, have to acknowledge that it was God that helped me through this day. God works in surprising ways. When we get to that point where we realize that whatever we're able to do, God is helping me do that. It changes my perspective and, and our perspective. And he said as time went on, that kind of, that, that uh, the sharpness of the pain kind of subsided a little bit. But he said, I still have to look back and I have to acknowledge that, you know, every day, every time, God helped me, amazingly helped me to get through. Now I say that for his loss, but we all have circumstances, broken relationships or whatever it might be. 
We all have problems, if you want to call it that way. And God does help us get through if we rely on Him. He works in amazing ways. Kind of goes against human logic. You know, we like to have things in a neat little box. I don't know why it is that most of these men, patriarchs, men of the Bible, and even today, most of the men that are used powerfully by God considered themselves maybe a bit weak, but they were willing. Weak but willing. I'm going to share with you something that really stood out to me. Young men, I don't know how old this man was. Uh, I know his wife because of a business uh, association. Uh, came to our store in Shipshawana. I They had been to our store, a young couple, childless, and he... They, they love to stand around and talk, and sometimes we talk too long, but they, they are kind of on a journey. They're, they're, uh, they're Bible-believing people, but they're on a journey. And this, uh, what I'm about to say really challenged me, and I'm going to hopefully challenge you with it. He was standing there, and we were talking, and, and, and finally he said, I said, well, this is new. We, we just getting in here. We don't know if God wants us to do this or how he wants us to do it. And, and it's a struggle to know how to proceed. And uh, he was almost ready to head out the door. And, and then I just kind of, he was walking toward the door. And I said, uh, uh, why don't you pray for us if you think about us? And, you know, he just turned around, took his hat off. He said, why don't we just pray right here? And he did. We did. And maybe you think that's awful. You shouldn't pray in public. But I'm going to challenge all of us. If you have opportunity, he could have walked out the door, but he was willing to be used of God at that moment. Never, never take for granted your uh, opportunities. God wants to use old and young. Doesn't matter if you're a lady or a guy. Uh, I would have taken a couple steps back if his wife would have done that. But for him, I just felt I was just blessed that there's a young man, doesn't know me that well, but he's willing to stand there in public and pray. So, in conclusion, I, I need to, to bring this to a close. Does, does God surprise you? Do you have something to share? Is there Are there things that through your grief and trial... You see that God is still on the throne. He's still working. He still has a plan. Don't give up on looking, seeking those amazing things that God, the beautiful things that God wants to do in your life. It's kind of shot through the whole Bible. It, if you look at Scripture, you start reading, you think about how God used ungodly people sometimes, and, and they couldn't help themselves. God used them to fulfill and accomplish his purpose. I think of many. I think of, of the Tower of Babel, or Babel, however you want to say it. I think of, of armies that destroyed themselves. I think of on and on and on. But the men of God, the people of God that said yes to God were used in a beautiful way by God. You know... I, I want to say this before I quit. Many people today think that being in the kingdom is all about a grand adventure, and it truly is. It truly is. If you're serious about serving the Lord, you're going to go places that might make you feel a little uncomfortable, maybe all the time, I don't know. It truly is an adventure. But don't think that God has to move you out there somewhere, halfway around the world. God is looking for people to, to go forward right where they're at. If you're here this morning, God has a purpose for you. And he wants to uh, do amazing things. He wants you to, to be a vessel that he can use. He's looking for people that are steady when the heat is up and the battle is fierce. We just go on and go forward. How has God worked in your life in the past week? 
I'm sure you weren't thinking about this. I wasn't either until about Thursday of this week. What has God done in your life? How has he, how has he blessed you and those people around you? Or was it just the way life is? It's just okay. We're just okay. Is God a part of your life? It's maybe a, a deeper question. Why don't we close with a prayer? Let's stand and, and pray. Heavenly Father, we pause before you this morning, keenly aware that what we think is an absolute failure, you're able to turn around and change and go a different direction. Father, I pray for each one that is here that you would give new purpose and a, a sensitivity to you working in, in all of our lives. Father, I pray your blessing upon this group here. Maybe we think we're weak, but you have a great work for us to do in our community and in our work, in our homes, and wherever we go, around the world, wherever we go. And so I pray and I plead, Lord, that you would fill us with your spirit and help all of us to focus first and foremost on you. Help us, Lord, to, to just rest knowing that you... You have an answer for everything. So be with us and bless us this week. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Going to open it up for uh, testimonies. If you have a testimony of something that God has been doing in your life or you feel he wants to do, I'd just like to hear from you this morning. strength will save us your right hand will lead us your unfailing love will see us through may your unfailing love rest upon us as we put our hope in you lover of righteousness and of justice, may your unfailing love rest on us. May your unfailing love.